So we're going to pick up today at the end of Genesis 11. We're going to kind of skim over the Tower of Babel. But before we jump in, I um, just want to ask you guys on, on recap, instead of me just saying everything, where have we been? For those of you who've been here, this is part four. And um, how have things been going so far? Does anybody remember anything so far? Flood. Flood last time. So what was the results, end result of the, of the flood? Covenant, right? And what was the covenant that God had made with Noah? What's that? The rainbow. Rainbow. It was the sign of the covenant, but what was the promise? He wouldn't destroy the earth. He wouldn't, just, he wouldn't flood and destroy the earth anymore. And so one thing we see um, with, the, with the covenant, the Noahic covenant, that we have to remember as we go through the Old Testament is that it becomes the foundation for all the rest. Right, so we saw at the very beginning the creation was good. We saw the fall, and then last week at the Noahic covenant, we saw that now this um, this act of mercy on God's part gives an opportunity for redemption. Because if you think about it, if every time things got really bad, God decided to start over again, can you imagine that we would be starting over a lot, right? Like right now, like we look at the world today and we're like, man, it's bad. And the rainbow and God's covenant with Noah is one of the reminders that he's not going to just start over and flood the earth again. There's going to be the final act of recreation. But with that foundation, uh, now we are moving forward into redemption, where instead of destruction, God is going to take the broken creation and redeem it instead of destroying it again. And so Noah's covenant ends up becoming like the foundation for all the rest, because if it wasn't for that, there wouldn't be redemption. God would just can everybody pretty much indefinitely. And so we're going to pick up, we're going to transition from here. Uh, Genesis chapter 10 ended with the descendants of Noah uh, multiplying into nations. Genesis 11 begins with the Tower of Babel. We're not going to focus in on that tonight, trying to keep uh, 30,000 foot view somewhat. But we once again see mankind trying to be great aside from God. Right, so God comes down, confuses their languages. They try to ascend. God has to come down. It's kind of this funny thing. And so in Genesis 11, at the beginning, we see there is the origin of nations, plural. But we're going to look in today, and we're going to see the origin of the nation that God cares the most about and the one that he had specifically chosen. And so if you look at our chart that I have put up here that you're going to look at every time, we're now moving, as we end Genesis 11, into a new period. So I'll step aside. You can see Genesis 1 through 11, people call it the pre-patriarchal period. Right? It's that time of, of ancient history when kind of the, scene is, or the, the scenes are being set. Right? We see God as creator. We see the fall and all these different things. And they're very, they're very big and broad. In Genesis chapter 12, through the end of the book of Genesis in chapter 50, we're going to see how God is working on a almost a smaller scale in order to redeem this creation. It's not just the big uh, cataclysmic events of the first couple chapters. Now we're getting down a little bit more into the details. And uh, a helpful illustration that I read in a book recently is that God's covenants and his blessings now, it's almost switching to a, a bit more of a form of a relay race. So in a relay race, a baton is passed from one person to another. And so this is kind of the pattern that we're going to see in upcoming weeks in the Old Testament. And so today we're going to look at the guy by the name of Abraham. He's kind of the first one to be handed this baton, and then it will go through his descendants. And uh, just a heads up, at the beginning, his name is Abram, gets changed to Abraham. I will probably call him Abraham the whole time, because that's just how it works. So just be prepared for that. It's the same guy. You probably know that. But if we want to begin uh, at the end of chapter 11, if somebody wants to read verses 27 through 32 of Genesis 11. These aren't the hardest names out there. If, no, if nobody's a taker, I can move. <laughs> This is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haram, and Haram became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of, of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, 
father of both Milka and this uh, now Sarah was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Aaron, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. What's that? I said Haran, Haran, however you say it. That's all right. <laughs> A lot of them... Uh, if people are reading along, they can at least see it, right? Uh, we're not going to quiz you on pronunciation. I don't even have them all perfect. Uh, there are a few people we are introduced to in this setting, though, that we need to notice, right? First one's Abram or Abraham. He's the son of a guy by the name of Terah. Uh, we are introduced to Lot. Lot is Abraham's nephew, and he's going to show up a lot in subsequent narratives. And also Sarai, who later becomes Sarah, who is Abram's uh, wife. And we're introduced to a very important thing about her in verse 30. You guys see that? She's barren, right? So we were introduced to a bunch of characters, three we really need to pay attention to, and one with um, Sarah, that she does not have children. She's barren. She's been unable to have children. And so we see this extended family uh, moves along a different uh, geographical look to a different geographical location. And this is what my screensaver represents. Give me just a second. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it'll come to. Well, I don't know. I guess we're starting the slideshow. You saw it earlier, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll try it one more time. Am I ready? If you have never been to the Pennsylvania uh, Grand Canyon, behold, <laughs> it's beautiful. You should totally go there. There we go. It's um. I am not kidding, though. It is actually beautiful. And uh, we I lived an hour away from the PA Grand Canyon for, like, my whole life. This thing is really rebellious. Anyways, I'll, I can be the caption for you. You don't need to see that. So you can see the red lines, right? This is basically where um, Abram is journeying from. So his family starts down here, place of Ur, the Chaldeans. They go all the way up there, I can't reach, which is surprising, all the way up to Har uh, Haran or Har Haran, however you want to say it, kind of at the top. And then eventually, later on, we'll see him going south to Canaan. But this is where the family begins. And so, like, for perspective, this line here, this vertical red line, is roughly-ish 500 miles. So it's a hike. So they're moving from this place called Ur of the Chaldeans. They're going over to this place of Haran. And uh, it's there that they kind of set up shop. Now, it's we're not entirely sure at what point God speaks to Abraham. For some reason, they were going to be going to the land of Canaan, uh, verse 31 says, but they don't make it there. Instead, they pit stop in Haram, which is the top. It's like at the, it's the very top flat part um, where, the, where it just goes uh, horizontal. And so they pit stop there for some reason. They don't move any further. And that is where our setting uh, picks up today. So if somebody wants to go now and read uh, verses 1 through 3 of Genesis chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people of the earth will be a blessing through you. So this is the first record in Scripture of God speaking to Abram or Abraham. Is there anybody here tonight that has relocated far away from family? I know half of you guys here tonight are related, so I know you're all still here. <laughs> to the other half, have any of you relocated far away from family? No? I know if Jen was here, I know Jen's from Montana, which I think is cool. I'd like to go to Montana someday, and she used to live there. Like, it's pretty neat. Here they got mountains out there, and then we got hills here. Yeah. It's a hike, right? You you move away. For us, we live a, a grand, a huge, massive two hours and 45 minutes from my parents. And I feel like Abraham because I don't like to drive three hours with two little kids. And so we don't always get back to visit very often. But you can imagine it would be difficult to leave family behind. Now, it sound, it, at first glance, it seems like, oh, well, Abraham's father is dead from the previous section. 
if you add up the genealogies and stuff, a, a scholar named Gordon Wenham points out that Abraham's father probably actually died 60 years after Abraham left. So even though the text already says that Terah had died, it's just, it's giving you a setting of, you know, this is where this guy ends up. But if you add up how old he was when he had Abraham as a, as a son and how old Abraham was when he leaves, all these things, Abraham leaves his family behind. And did you see where they're supposed to be going? Did anybody notice where God tells them to go in verse 1? The land I'll show you. Doesn't that sound like the trip you want to sign up for? I am a, I am a planner. I like to have plans. I like to know where I'm going. I like to know what stops I am going to make on the way there. We like to know which, when we go on trips, how many, chick, like, how can we add a chick fil a here without it adding too many minutes to the trip? Right? You plan all these things out. To me, the idea of God speaking and saying, leave your whole family behind and go somewhere, and we're going to figure it out as we go. That's crazy to me. Like, I... God, could you give me some itinerary carved in stone like the Ten Commandments so I know where we're going? And instead, God says, listen, um, go ahead, Abraham, uh, move. Leave your family behind, father, your brother, aunts, uncles, cousins, whoever else, and uh, go to the place I'm going to tell you. And we don't even know anything about Abraham's faith background. We don't know if he was a worshiper of the true God or if God just hits him out of the blue. We really don't know much of anything. But God speaks to him, and God offers him this initial covenantal promise that he will make of him a great nation, and that through uh, him and ultimately his descendants, we'll see later, all the families or all the people of the earth will be blessed, plus some general blessings. And so we see this initial promise that God makes to Abraham, but we have one small problem. God has spoken to Abraham and says, Abraham, you know, go, go to this place I'm going to show you. I'm going to make you a, of you a great nation. Well, to make somebody into a great nation, you have to start with at least one kid, right? And Abraham has no kids, and he has a barren wife. And so we wonder, where is this nation going to come from? We'll see that much later. But if somebody wants to continue and read verses 4 through 6. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, the oak of Morah, at the time the Canaanites were in the land. So Abraham listens, right? God says, hey, Go where I'm going to show you. And Abraham says, okay. And he listens. And they go and they end up finding themselves in, Abraham, in uh, Canaan. So we have a Abram, uh, his wife Sarai. We have the nephew Lot, and then a random bunch of servants and shepherds or herdsmen, just different people, as we'll see later. They all leave Quran and they head down to the land of Canaan. Again, that's like the vertical red line on this map, kind of on the left. And so again, to the to the top of the land of Canaan, it's roughly 300 miles. To the bottom, it's roughly 500. So this is a hike. God says, go where I'm going to tell you. And they hop on their donkeys or camels or whatever they were riding in those days, not cars, not planes. And they just go out on an adventure with God to wherever he is going to end up. And they end up in the land of Canaan. And so we get a little more background here. That's our church logo. Apparently, it's cycling through things. Uh -huh. We get a little bit more background that Abraham is at this point in time 75 years old. And so we get another sense that this promise is quite the promise. God has said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Well, we don't have any kids. Okay, well, they can just go make some, presumably. Well, his wife's barren, and we have a guy who's 75. And so they end up coming to the land of Canaan now. The Canaanites live in the land, the text says. And does anybody remember... Uh, from the last time we met together here on a teaching night, the significance of Canaan and where Canaan comes from. The story of Noah. The promised land, yes, which is true. That's what we're going to get in the text today. Specifically from Noah's day. 
So if you remember what happened to Noah after the flood, they get off, they do all the things. Famous story with Noah that people laugh at. He got drunk. He got drunk and naked. Drunk and naked. And what happens? His one son sees him, thinks it's a great idea and party and everything, kind of makes light of it, and goes and tells the other brothers, right? Like, something that was in her head. Um, goes and tells the other brothers, like, hey, dad is naked and drunk in his tent and sleeping. This is great. Go check him out. And when Noah wakes up, he says, cursed be Canaan. Canaan was the son of Ham, the son of that was gazing upon the nakedness of Noah. So the curse upon Canaan and Canaan, the Canaanites, like over against God's people of Israel, began when Noah realized what had been done to him. And he uttered a curse on Canaan, the descendant of his, his what would be, end up being his grandson. And so that's the background we saw from last time. Now, if somebody wants to continue, read verses 7 through 9. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. And from there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called the name of and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Niger. All right, so now we see this third promise, right? I gave you guys that. And now, um, this is kind of three main promises that God gives to Abraham. There's this idea of a great nation, a multiple descent. We're going to see it uh, explained in many different ways as we go through. Um, we're going to try to go through a lot of chapters tonight, but we might have to pit stop and finish next time. So we see there's the great nation. We're going to see that now there is a promised land, right? He travels to the land of Canaan, and he is there. And now God says to, to Abraham, look, this land is going to belong to you and your descendants. And then ultimately the other promises that through him, through his descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so now we see this promise that this specific geographic, geographical territory is going to belong to Abraham's descendants, despite the fact that right now Abraham does not own anything. We'll see throughout the text how Abraham is pitching his tent as he goes. He's traveling as a nomad. He's going from place to place. God told him to pack his bags and take off. So he's showing up and pitching a tent here, pitching a tent there. He's camping effectively. And in spite of that, God offers this incredible promise saying, look, all of this is going to belong to you. And so he responds in worship and built an altar. And then he journeys on down to the Negev. The Negev is kind of a desert region of Judah. I had a picture, but I'm not going to try that right now. I'll show it to you when we're done. So things are starting pretty well. Um, we'll see how things go next. If you want to look with me now, at uh, chapter 12 and read verses 10 through 20. You could split them up if you want. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe to, in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful, and when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, ox, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. That's fine. Somebody wants to read 17 through 20. You can keep going. Somebody else is not going. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram to fight Sarai. So that Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why did you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men and sent them on the way with his wife and everything he had. Wasn't she 75 or something? Or she's not, not quite yet. So, okay. yeah. 
So I was reading a little bit about this. I mean, you can be beautiful and be 75, right, Bill? Yep, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so one thing that I had read is right after the flood, God had said they're going to, a man's days are going to be 120 years, basically, right? Earlier, you see people living hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after the flood. It, it rapidly declines. But still, Abraham still lives to, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, he's pushing 200. So the number hasn't cranked all the way down to 120 yet. So there's some people think that maybe, you know, Abraham and Sarah being like 75 and 65 might be more like 50 and 40-ish. So she's like nice looking 30 or 40 year old maybe. Maybe not 75. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what they looked like at that time. Like the people that lived to be 900, did they only start looking old in the last 100 years or did they look old for 800 years? Well, I don't know. The 900, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that is one thought people have regardless. Um, for some reason, Pharaoh enjoys looking at her, so he decides that he's going to take her, uh, regardless of how old she is. It is funny to think about, though. This passage kind of shocks us. Like we see it, or like, why in the what in the world, right? Like, like what is going on? Like, you know, this is his plan, right? And I find this passage, as much as we don't like it, and it's kind of weird, I find it really encouraging, actually. And the reason being is I think it reminds us, amongst other things, that God doesn't choose perfect people to work with. Do you know why? Because there's no people to choose. Because there'd be no people to choose from if God only used perfect people. <laughs> so when we see through various places in Scripture uh, that God works with sorts of things like this. At home groups last week, we, Diane was wearing a shirt that said, uh, Jesus, bless this hot mess, I think is what it says. And I'm like, I kind of like that, you know. And so we see this thought that God only works through imperfect people because that's the only kind of people he has to work with. So seeing that Abraham, even though he's a great man of faith, He's still flawed in that sense. It's kind of encouraging, but I'm sure Sarah wasn't exactly happy about it all. And it's interesting that, that here we see kind of a first lapse in Abraham's faith. Right? We think back to Abraham, we're like, he's a great man of faith, right? I mean, he's the guy that God says, leave your family behind, go on a big move, and you're going to go to wherever I should. We're going to figure it out as we go. Abraham's like, okay, we're going to go. Sounds great. And then God says, uh, I'm going to give you descendants like a great nation, all these things. And Abraham believes God so many different times. But Abraham also uh, has some lapses of faith. For one, he was told his descendants would inhabit the land of Canaan. Well, as soon as there's a famine in the land, what's he do? Leaves the land of Canaan. Now, that was kind of a minor thing. Okay, you know, maybe we'll give him a little grace on that one. Here's another thought we have to think about. God had promised to Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Right? You're going to have lots of, lots of descendants down the road. If Abraham went to the land of Egypt, track with me on this, and he's got a super nice looking, possibly old, but still nice looking wife in the land of Egypt, and they kill him to take her, how would the promise come to pass? Think about that. If there is going to be a nation of people coming from Abraham, and Abraham doesn't have any kids, and God's promise is true, Abraham's not going to be dying anytime soon. Right? Because he doesn't have any kids to, to fulfill the promise. So if God is a promise-keeping God, then that means that, that Abraham is... He's doing okay right now. He doesn't have a whole lot to worry about. And so with a lack of faith, he's like, well, they're going to kill me. Well, but Abraham, God made you a promise. There's no reason to believe they're going to kill you. So he ends up going and, and uh, lapsing in faith, sending his wife off with Pharaoh. God ends up sending some plagues, brings him out of the mess of his own making. They throw him out of Egypt, more or less, or escort him. We don't know exactly how that went. And he's going to return now to the land of Canaan. Somebody wants to read chapter 13, verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt to the ancient chief. Negev. Okay, and, and wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. The, the Negev or Negev, sometimes it's 
the Hebrew B and G letter is the same, whether it's a B or B, it's just got a little dot in it, it's one of those weird things. So we don't know if it's Negev or Negev, but it's the southern region of the Promised Land. So anytime you hear it, it's a, it's a desertous region. So they're back in the Promised Land. We're going to see, um, I'm going to kind of summarize verses 2 through 11. There is a little uh, quarrel between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock uh, with the herdsmen of Lot's because apparently they got so much, so many animals and people that the land is not big enough for both of them. And then in response to this, uh, they kind of separate. Somebody wants to read verses 11 through 13. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and great sinners against the Lord. So they had been together this whole time. Because of this little division, they separate. Uh, Abraham gives Lot first dibs. We can see that in the section that I kind of summarized over. Lot decides to take the land that looks really good, even though it's full of bad people. And Abraham, again, settles in the land of Canaan. And we're going to see God's response. If you want to read verses 14 through 17. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. <clears throat> All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then their offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of and that one at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. So again, no, that's all right. we, we see more promises reiterated, right? And again, I, I tried, I don't know if I missed any. I tried to give you a synopsis of every time promises are reiterated in the handout. So we, we've already seen that God's promise to Abraham land, to his descendants. Again, we see this land is promised specifically that it will be given to his offspring forever, forever is a long time. So this geographical territory belongs to Abraham's descendants, no matter what anybody else might say. And God specifically says in verse 17 that I will give it to you. It says, Abraham, walk through all the land, kind of try to get a taste for the promise. This is all going to belong to you and your, your descendants. It's an, a pretty amazing thing because when we think about uh, God as the sovereign creator, ultimately everything in heaven and on earth belongs to him. Everything. There is nothing that is not rightfully God's. He's got authority over it all. And so as such, when he says this this piece of dirt, this is yours, it's God's to give, no matter who lives there. And so God grants this promise again to Abraham. Abraham again moves his tent. Remember, he's kind of a nomad. And again, he builds an altar in worship. Genesis 14, we see a, a bunch of fighting with local kings. Uh, Lot, the nephew, gets captured. And then Abraham goes and rescues him. We're not going to focus in on that because we want to focus primarily on the covenants. But again, we see time and time again that God is, is giving these promises to Abraham, saying, Abraham, this is what I'm going to do for you. So if somebody wants to go and read now uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Elizar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So God speaks to Abraham again. Right? There's years that are passing between these things, presumably. And God says, look, your, your rewards can be very great. God comes, he offers this promise. And then Abraham points out once again, we still got a problem here, God. I don't have any kids. But you've promised me all these things. God's met with Abraham. He's promised things again and again and again. This is the third time now, I believe, that God has promised things to Abraham. And he says, look, I don't even have an area. The only person I got is this guy named Eliezer. I mean, obviously, he had more than just this guy. But Abraham's point is, I don't have a son. I don't have any biological descendants. I only have this servant. 
And again, we have to remember that Abraham is at this point at minimum 75 years old. His wife is still barren. And so this thought of having innumerable descendants, a, a nation of offspring, seems like a hard task, doesn't it? When you got an older gentleman with a barren wife and no kids, and there's this promise. And furthermore, there's this promise that, that God is going to give the land of Canaan to, to Abraham's offspring. Abraham has no offspring to give it to. Right? So all these promises that God has issued, Abraham's thinking, you know, I have no offspring to inherit the land. I have no offspring to create this great nation. I, he's working for nothing. All he's got is maybe this one guy that he could effectively adopt. So we'll see what God says if somebody wants to read verses 4 through 6. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but the son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So Abraham goes to God, and he says, God, I don't have any kids. Right? Who's going to inherit all these? God, you're giving me all these wonderful promises. But there's nobody to receive them. And all I got is a, a servant that I can effectively adopt. And God says, listen, no, Abraham, you're going to have a son. You, Eliezer, this servant in your house, he's not going to inherit everything. You're going to have a son. And furthermore, some translations don't include it. I don't know what Lori's translation is, but yours actually did, which is nice. A lot of translations just say your own son. But the Hebrew is literally a son coming from your own loins or bowels or whatever. Like God is explicitly saying, you're going to make this kid. Right, just so you know, like that's what it's going to be. And so we see this promise, and now we see uh, not only that his descendants are going to be like the sand of the seashore in number, but they're going to be like the stars. So you have this guy, no kids, barren wife. Apparently things aren't working out so good. He's a, he's an older man, and God says to him, "You are going. Your descendants are going to be so numerous you can't even count them when you don't even have." Them. One. And he said, not only this, it's not going to be an adoptive son, but it's going to be, this could be your baby. Like you could take the DNA test and Abraham, it's going to be your kid. It's going to go well. And so against all reason, against all odds, against sight, against anything that would make any sense, Abraham believes God. Can you imagine being in that situation? I'm sure all of us at some point in time have faced what was seemingly an impossible situation. We look at it like, I don't know how in the world this is ever going to work out. It just seems impossible. Think about how many things are against Abraham right now. How unlikely it is that he's ever going to have a kid. Right? It seems it's a seeming impossibility. But against all odds, and even though it didn't make any sense, he believes God. The scripture says it's counted to him as righteousness. And so now we see this idea that even before the law came, that you could find right standing with God through faith, which we know in the New Testament ultimately comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Derek Kidner, a biblical scholar, points out that Abraham's trust was personal, it was in the Lord, and it was also propositional, it was in God's word. And so Abraham finds a righteous standing before God through faith. Not through works, not through his deeds, through believing God when what God said had, was completely wild and impossible, he believed. And this ends up becoming a basis for the New Testament belief in justification by faith. And if somebody wants to continue in verses 7 through 11. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land and take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all this to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. So if you were here on uh, Sunday, I talked about cutting covenant. Was anybody here Sunday and remember that? Yeah. Right, this idea of you cut the animal in half, 
separate them, and then the two parties of the covenant would pass through between the pieces of the animal. And effectively what it said was, if we break this covenant, we break this contract, let us be like this animal that was cut to pieces. And so there's a lot of symbolism here. People kind of disagree, but to some extent, this is what God does with Abraham, is they cut covenant together. And he says, look, you go and you cut these animals. Like, you believe me, you can believe my word is effectively what God ends up saying uh, here to Abraham. And then it continues, if you want to read verses 12 through 16. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners of the land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God speaks again to Abraham, and we see a little a heads up on the book of Exodus, right? The people of Israel in, in Egypt, and then ultimately the Exodus there. And we see this interesting thought at the end there. Uh, they, in the fourth generation, or roughly 400 years later, God is going to bring them back because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And so one of the things that we can't lose sight of in the Old Testament, I'm going to try to draw all these pieces together as we go through. There was a couple of reasons for Joshua's conquest of the Promised Land. Okay, One of them was because God promised the land, the descendants of Abraham, as we see in today's text. Ultimately, in God's mind, it belonged to Abraham, or to his descendants. Geographically, area, it was theirs. But then a second reason that they were given that land specifically, can you draw the connection here from verse 16, is they were displacing the people who were what? Got to read between the lines a little bit. That works. Bad. Yeah. The Canaanites were not good people. Okay? So there was a lot of awful pagan rituals and stuff. They would sacrifice their children to false gods, these different things. So two things we have to keep in mind. When you look at the conquest of Canaan land in the days of Joshua, uh, David kind of picks that back up. We see David doing some conquering, all these different things. For one, the land was promised to the descendants of Abraham, the people of Israel. It belonged to them according to God. But for two, the people that were there, they, des they deserved wrath. And so God works through a variety of means to bring about judgment. Right? We saw in Noah's day God brought about judgment. How? They flooded everything, right? Later we'll see that God brings judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. How? Fire and brimstone from, from above, right? Then God brings judgment upon all of the Amorites, Canaanites, all the other ites in the land of Canaan through Joshua. How? What's that? War? Yeah, a sword. War, a sword. <clears throat> so when we think of the conquest that way, it changes things a little bit. If you think... If God can send a flood and God is just because God is a just God and he punishes sin, and he, he is the one with the authority to do that, and that's what God did in the flood is he punished sin. God, Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone, he's punishing sin. And so when God sends the people of Israel into Canaan land to wipe out the descendants or to the, the people there, and that's passages we don't exactly like to, to read, God is using Joshua and the people of Israel as if they were a flood or a plague on Egypt or any of the other things, fire and brimstone, he's just using a different means to accomplish his ends of bringing judgment upon the ungodly. And so he says here, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So like, apparently they, the wrath had not bubbled up enough yet. There was still an opportunity for mercy to some extent, probably. 
um, but they weren't quite deserving of the level of wrath um, that was going to be coming. So there ends up being this delay, and ultimately God sends his people in there as a means of, of punishing sin in the land of Canaan. And so this is all a uh, God speaking to Abraham, and then the scene closes. If somebody wants to read verses 17 through 21. You can just call them all lights. It'll be okay. <laughs> the sun had set, and the darkness had fallen. A smoking firepot with a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land from the river of the Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of all the ites. <laughs> I was expecting you to take them like one at a time. So give me this no, to... you can have them. Uh, <laughs> all right. Can you see where my mouse is here? Yes. That's the Euphrates River. All right. And then the river in Egypt, they're not sure if it's part of maybe the Red Sea here or possibly down here. But you can see that's the land that God's promised to the descendants of Abraham. Okay, This is the promised land. People always hear about the promised land. You're like, well, why is it called the promised land? Because God promised it to Abraham. It's like that's right here. It's, the scripture doesn't call it the promised land. We call it the promised land because it was promised. But this whole area, now we don't know. As far as we know, it's not going all the way like this way, but at least vertically from somewhere down here to this is the red line of Euphrates River all the way up there. This whole section here, that belongs to God's people. That's what God says. He says this land, God is the one that has the authority. Again, he's the, the owner of heaven and earth. He's the sovereign God. And he says, look, I'm going to give this to you. This is your possession. This is Congratulations. Like, this, is, this is what I'm going to give to you. And so this is God's promise. Again, there's three promises, these innumerable descendants that are going to become a great nation, uh, the land, and then that through him or through his descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so now we see not only is it just this land, but God specifically says all of these different ites, right? This They might live there right now. They might be the ones that have their address there right now, but this doesn't belong to them. It's going to belong to you guys, and that's what God says. And so we'll see that kind of unfolding throughout the Old Testament. But we still have one problem throughout all of this. Abraham's offspring are going to inhabit. This is their possession. Well, so whose is it? We're still not having kids. Right? So time and time and time again, you have to think of Abraham's faith. Right? God says, Look at all this land. And, and at one point, God even says, look, Abraham, take a walk. Go all the way through the land. This all belongs to your kids. And Abraham's like, that's great. What kids? Like, I can see it, but who's it going to go to? Like, he can write up his will. It's like, okay, I, Abraham, I will all this land to so-and-so. I don't know who they are yet. I haven't met them. And so in all of this, God's making these wonderful promises, but there's still so much to be desired. And so when we are impatient as human beings, when we are struggling in faith and all of these different things, oftentimes people end up taking matters into their own hands. If somebody wants to jump in and read uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, may, you, may the wrong done to me by you, I give my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Six, two? Uh, no, that was, that was good. So... <laughs> We got another problem, right? Abraham's a great man of faith. 
most of the time. But like us, he doesn't get it right all the time. First time they go down to Egypt, hands his wife over to another guy because he's worried he's going to die, which would have made God a liar, because if he would have died, then none of these things would have happened. And then secondly, it's been so long, they're minimum 75 years old, right? It's been, it, time's been passed, and I think he's about 85 when this happens. Still no babies, right? So there comes a point where he's struggling, and, and Sarah has this great idea of like, oh, we're going to do like a surrogate thing. I got this servant, and I'll basically claim the baby as my own. Let's just, God made this promise. God apparently doesn't know what he's doing because promise hasn't come to pass. So let's just make it happen. And don't you just love that apparently the servant isn't barren? Like of all things, right? You know, you got the barren wife for the longest time, and it's like, servant, once and done, apparently this is how it works. It's just such a, one of those fascinating things. And so there's this division in the household because now this servant's kind of got bragging rights. She's looking with contempt on Sarah, like, ha-ha, I got a kid and you don't. You know, it's kind of how it's going. And so now there's this problem. We end up seeing that she runs away and uh, is fleeing because Sarah is not too pleased with this, and she kind of mistreats her. And so she ends up being visited by an angel as she has already read, fled away the servant girl. And this is amazing. If somebody wants to read verses 13 through 16. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Ber um, Baruch. It is still there between Kadesh and Barak. So Hagar bore Abram's son, and Abram, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So this is a beautiful picture, right? There's this messy situation. They take matters into their own hands. They Baby ends up coming, or is on the way, rather. And a pregnant servant girl is sent away because Sarah is so jealous. And she's out in the desert all alone and probably scared and pregnant on top of all of it, which I have heard is not pleasant. And she's out there in the midst of all of this, and an, an angel comes and visits her, and she responds and says, God is a God who sees me, essentially is the message. And to me, this is so awesome and encouraging. But you have this lady who has kind of gone through the ringer. She was suddenly a wife to her master, and then it actually worked. So then she, the other woman master is jealous, sends her off. It's this awful situation. And then she says, in the midst of all of this, God cares. God sees me in the midst of my affliction. God is not distant and unaware. He's not disconnected. He's right here. With me. And I want to encourage us with that tonight that God sees when we're going through troubles. And not only this, because God sees, God cares. He's not distant from our troubles and our afflictions. He's not up in heaven as some distant creator God that doesn't care. He's not only the sovereign, almighty creator God, but he's also the covenant God that gets down into the details of life. Right? He is here with us, so much so that he sends us, ultimately sends his son into the world. Think about the love that God has for us and the fact that that none of us are, are too far gone. None of us are forgotten in God's sight. He sees us when we're going through trials, and he is there with us, whether we realize it or not. And so we end up seeing that we now have a baby, finally. All, the, all these promises to Abraham concerning offspring, we've got the first one. It didn't really come the right way. But at the ripe old age of 86, 11 years after the promise first comes, Abraham has a son. We're going to try to jump in quick and do a crash course on chapter 17, and that'll be the last bit we go through. If somebody wants to begin by reading verses 1 through 8 in chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and with great will and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. 
no longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make your nation, I will make nations of you, and kings will come to you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. I will be their God. Is that it? Yep. For now. We'll a little bit more. So this is one of the most important passages in the Old Testament. I hope as we're going through this tonight, you can trace the, again, we're true. the whole point of this series is not to just take little principles here and there, but to see the big picture of what God is doing and how the whole, how God is telling one grand story throughout time, especially in the Old Testament, how it all connects together. And so God speaks to Abraham here. Now, Abraham is now 99 years old. Does anybody remember how old he was when this all started? 75. So I'm not great at math. Riley, you're a math person. That's 20, 24 years, right? I was going to say, you're, you're, you're probably the best numbers person here. 24 years. For perspective, I'm 29. And a couple of, quite a couple of you here tonight aren't even 25. You imagine, for us, we like to get a promise and have it come to pass the next day. We like to do microwaves, not crockpots, right? You like to be able to do instant things. Can you imagine... God coming to you and saying, I have got great plans for you in the future. Here's this awesome promise. You're going to have to wait 24 years minimum before you even know the extent of it and 25 years until it's fulfilled in the smallest little way that it's fulfilled because the grand fulfillment takes hundreds of years. Doesn't that sound fun? Waiting decades and centuries for a promise to come to pass? Doesn't everybody want that? <clears throat> Think about how great Abraham is as a man of faith. So 24 years have passed. Now God comes to him and kind of elaborates on this covenant. Uh, for one, these promises are, are showered upon him again. But now he says to Abraham, look, I want you to walk before me blamelessly. Essentially, there's this idea that Abraham, if you're going to be my guide, if your people are going to be my people, then again, you have to reflect me to the earth. Right? Humankind was made to bear the image of God, to be a reflection and representation of God to the rest of the earth. We saw this even last Sunday. And so we see throughout time that different people walk with God. They, they reflect God. And so now this is the promise to, or the request of Abraham. Abraham walked blamelessly before me. And then he gives Abraham a new name. Right? He, he goes from Abram to now Abraham. So now we're actually allowed to call him Abraham. Uh, Ham, the end of it, comes from a Hebrew word that means essentially multitude. It can almost mean like a clamor or like a, a crazy amount of noise. So like it's this multitude idea. And so he's now not just a, a father of um, a, high, a high father is what Abram means. Abraham means father of a multitude. You know, he still only has one kid that he shouldn't have even had. And in verses 7 and 8, we see that God promises to, Ab to be Abraham's God and that, that he would be God to Abraham's descendants. There's this covenant between the two of them. And so as such, this is where Israel as God's chosen people comes from. Think about this. Everybody probably knows, yeah, Israel is chosen by God, right? Everybody knows that. That's not news to anybody. This is where it's from. Because we have to remember, Israel is merely the descendants of Abraham. Right. They are the offspring that God has promised Abraham. Abraham says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. That nation is Israel. And they end up coming down the line. It takes a long time, but they are going to be his special chosen people. God says, look, I'm going to be your God. He enters into a covenantal relationship with the uh, people of Israel, and this is where it begins. <clears throat> and then he continues. If somebody wants to read verses 9 through 14. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout the generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. 
You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Uh, down to verse 14. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his horsemen shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So with the covenant with Abraham, this is now the sign of the covenant that it was such a big deal. We see even in the New Testament, uh, one of the whole reasons the book of Galatians was written is because they wanted to keep circumcision as a requirement um, for Christian believers. Right? It was such a foundational thing in the Old Testament to who the people of God were. Now, they weren't the only people in that day uh, to, to circumcise men. That wasn't like only an Israel thing. There was some nations that did. There were some nations that didn't. But essentially what it seems is that this permanent change to a man's body would be a permanent reminder of, of the covenant that God had made, that God's covenant was going to be an everlasting covenant. And this was one sign that would distinguish God's people from the rest. If somebody wants to continue now, read verses 15 through 21. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come to her. Abram fell face down and he laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish a covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. So first we saw Abraham's name was changed from Abram to Abraham. Right? He's going to be a father of a multitude now. Now Sarah's name is changed. The meaning doesn't change. Uh, Sarah's name means princess. But God makes it clear here there's now a promised line. Okay, there's Yes, there's Ishmael. There was this um, idea that they had they were going to go do things their way. And there's that, but that's not the line of promise. God has established covenant with Abraham. The covenant's not going to go down through Ishmael. It's going to go down through, instead, Sarah. And how does Abraham respond? He laughs. And why does he laugh? He didn't believe it. Yeah, some people are like, oh, yeah, laughter's a happy thing. Laughter is Abraham saying, God did did you forget who you're talking to? I'm 100 years old. My lady is 90 years old. And I don't know when they got married. Say they've been married for 70 years. Okay, I'm not going to be graphic. But for 70 years, they haven't been having babies. They've been married the whole time. Apparently something don't work. All right, just saying. For however long they've been married, it hasn't worked. 70 plus years, whatever it might be. And suddenly God says, yeah, I know that I've been promising you all these things all along, and you finally had a kid named Ishmael, which you probably shouldn't have had. And uh, you probably shouldn't have had him. And then not only that, you finally have the kid through whom the promise could come, but God says, no. He's not the son of promise. Instead, there's going to be a different son. It's going to go down through Isaac. And it's interesting enough, Isaac's name literally means he laughs. If you look in the, in the Hebrew text, when it says that Abraham laughed, and when it says you shall name him Isaac, it's 100% identical. It's the same exact word. And so literally, it's a consistent reminder to Abraham 
of this laughter. And to me, I think it's interesting here that it's almost as if it, it, he's reminding Abraham, don't forget who you've been talking to all along. Don't forget who has made you these promises. Right? When he um, when God appears to Abraham in, in chapter 17, verse 1, he, re, he reveals himself. He says, look, I am God Almighty. And if God is God Almighty, what does that mean? It means there's nothing that is too hard for him. No matter how impossible it looks, no matter how difficult the situation is, no matter how crazy, how much crazy faith it takes to believe, if God's made a promise, he's God Almighty. It's, there's nothing that's going to be too hard for him. So you might laugh and say, this is ridiculous. Oh, I'm a hundred years old. There's no way. And God says, look, I'm God Almighty. There's nothing that's too hard for me. And so Isaac's name ends up becoming this reminder constantly of the need to believe God when he makes unbelievable promises. Because with God, nothing is impossible. Somebody wants to finish now. We're going to read verses 22 through 27, and we will close. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So this is pretty cool. Abraham is not only a man of faith, but he's a man who walks and walks. He listens. What's it say in... Um, Verse 23, when he did it. The very day. Very day, right? Poor Abraham's the guy that's been waiting for 24 years for the promise to come to pass. And Abraham is not the kind of guy to dilly dally. God says, look, I'm going to establish my covenant. My covenant, the sign of it is circumcision. And so Abraham's like, okay, this is the sign. Come here, boys. We're going we're gonna to do this thing. <laughs> He's not messing around. He's not saying, well, God, you know, like, this is kind of weird and, like, uncomfortable. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. He doesn't drag his feet. He doesn't make it take 24 more years. He's the kind of guy that acts. So he walks in obedience. And now we see uh, through this covenant that God has established with Abraham, God now has a chosen man by the name of Abraham. And he said to Abraham, you are going to become a great nation. The nation becomes... Israel. And so all the Old Testament is focused on the nation of Israel, the promised nation that descended from Abraham. And the story of Joshua in so many is them taking the promised land that God promised to who? Abraham and his descendants, right? And so this is what the whole Old Testament is showing how God kept his promise to Abraham. So if you don't understand Abraham, you don't understand the rest of the Old Testament because all of it is pointing back to show you that God is a covenant-keeping, faithful God. He promised these things to Abraham, and he was going to fulfill them. And even when God's people sin, and they find themselves in exile, right? There's this time where they go into exile in Babylon, and they lose the promised land because of their sin. Guess what happens? God brings them back. Because that land belongs to them because God promised it to Abraham. So a couple of quick takeaways now, and then we'll pray. For one, we see Abraham's incredible faith, right? And this basis for justification by faith alone, even in the Old Testament. I want to remind you this evening that faith by nature is a response when we don't see or understand. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. Faith and sight are opposite of one another. Faith is what you do not have sight for things. And then the author of Hebrews in chapter 11 goes on in verses 8 through 10 and says this. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. And by faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Again, Abraham left 
his family, his homeland, all of these things behind to go to wherever God was going to say completely in faith. And when God says, look, you're going to have a baby, and he's just like, I, at least at the first time, even though he was too old, even though his wife was barren, originally he believed, but even though he's a great man of faith, he wrestles with this. And again, a second takeaway for us tonight is that God only works through imperfect people. Abraham is a great man of faith, and he believes God, and it's counted to him as righteousness. And everybody loves Abraham because he believed God for the impossible, but he also laughed when God had issued the promise at 99 because he didn't believe it. He also gave his wife away to Pharaoh because he thought they were going to kill him. And he also said, well, she's too barren. I'll listen to my wife, and we'll take the servant girl instead. And so we see all these different times. I think that God puts these things in his word to remind us that everybody's imperfect, and we not we ought not to idolize anybody in his, in his word. Jesus is the only one that was perfect. A third thought, again, is that God sees us in our time of need. There was an angel that went to Hagar. She was desperate, pregnant, alone, out in the wilderness. An angel came, and she saw and realized, God sees and God cares about me in the midst of my trial. Famous song says, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And last, I want to encourage us this, this evening to remember that he is God Almighty. Right? He is able to do the impossible. He is able to promise something, make it take 25 years on purpose, so that he can fulfill the promise with an old man and a barren woman who for decades could not have a child. Right? God is able to do those things, and sometimes the waiting comes just so he can blow the door off the hinges when the promise finally comes. That's the kind of God that we serve. He's God Almighty, and he's amazing. Amen. Let's pray this evening. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, that you are God Almighty. I thank you that there is nothing that is too hard for you. And even when we find ourselves uh, at times in impossible situations, I, it's such an encouragement to me to know that you are a God who sees, that you know what we're going through, that you care about us, that you watch over us. And Lord, there's nothing that's too hard for you. And anything that is within your will, uh, it's not impossible because you are the God who for whom nothing is impossible. I thank you for this hope. I thank you for the promise you've made to your people Israel and the fact that we can see your covenantal faithfulness to them all throughout the Old Testament, how you work to, to grant them the land that you had given. And I just pray that, Father, as we go through uh, so many weeks of study in the Old Testament, you would give us understanding of your word, that we'd be able to see how all the pieces fit together and that it would cause us to understand your word better, uh, to serve you better by it, and to love you more. Lord, I thank you for those who gave me their time tonight to come out for the study. Pray you bless them as they go now. In Jesus' name, amen.